With gigabytes of memory in your current device watching this video, it may be hard to believe that just 4 decades ago CPUs were limited to accessing a maximum of 1 megabyte. This limitation originated from 8086 CPUs with their 20-bit addressing bus. 286 CPUs had a slightly larger addressing bus of 24 bits and could address a maximum of 16 megabytes of system memory. With the dawn of 32-bit CPUs, a 386DX could theoretically address a maximum of 4GB with its 32-bit addressing bus. Even though addressable memory increased significantly, we can still observe the remnants of the 1MB memory barrier on much more modern systems. Here is a boot screen of a Pentium 3, where base memory of 640KB is displayed. On our 386 with 32MB of system memory, the system configuration screen is very similar. The base memory is available to MS-DOS and the applications it executes. The remaining 384 kilobytes of the first megabyte are unavailable to the operating system and reserved for optional hardware devices. And below the base memory, the remaining memory labeled as extended memory is listed. Memory management is a complex topic and deserves a dedicated video. But for today, all we need to understand is that by using memory managers like HiMemSys or EMM386.exe, we can access the extended memory area. We will have a lot of memory on this system, more than what is useful. A386 did well with 4MB, or 8MB in case you needed something to brag about. With 32MB, there is a lot of memory that most probably will remain unused. Unless we find something that can utilize it. Something like a RAM drive. And this is what we are going to do today. We will explore the possibility of running MS-DOS and Windows 3.1 from a RAM drive. If you're interested in attempting today's experiment, but are concerned about the high costs associated with 4MB SIM modules, you can order 30-pin SIM PCBs from today's video sponsor, PCBWay. As one of the leading PCB manufacturers in China, PCBWay is committed to delivering exceptional quality, but also offers services to the community through its shared project space where creators can make their projects available for purchase. You can find my 30-pin SIM PCBs on their platform, designed to function with FPM and EDO memory chips. All you'll need in addition to the PCBs are a few SMD capacitors and the memory chips. If you possess the necessary skills, you can also salvage memory chips from an old memory module, provided they have the correct specifications. PCBWay offers additional services such as PCB assembly, 3D printing and sheet metal fabrication. For more information, please visit PCBWay.com. Links are in the video description. But now, let's go back and use our 8 4MB SIM modules, for which PCBWay produced the PCBs. I started with installing MS-DOS on a regular storage media, in my case a 128MB compact flash card. After a restart, we can see that MS-DOS set up HiMem.sys for us. It is testing the extended memory area, which we need to set up our RAM drive. Luckily, we do not need any third-party application for that. Yes, MS-DOS ships with RAM drive capabilities. The driver we can use is called ramdrive.sys and is located in the DOS directory. To create a RAM drive, we simply have to add an entry to config sys and provide a few parameters. The first parameter specifies the size of the RAM drive in kilobytes. I set mine to 25MB, which should leave us with 7MB for the remaining system. The second parameter specifies the sector size, and the third specifies how many root entries the drive can have. 1024 is the maximum. The switch E at the end of the command tells ramdrive.sys to use extended memory. You may have figured out already that this only works when HiMem.sys is loaded and grants access to the extended memory area. And after a reboot, we see a new block of text appearing on the screen. The Microsoft RAM drive has been created and is accessible under the drive letter D. Now that our RAM drive is ready, we can go ahead and move MS-DOS to it. We could just copy the content of drive C to drive D, but we could also archive the content in a zip file which is the method I will be using today. To accomplish this, I will be using the tool pkzip, because it offers a simple method to update an archive with changed files only, which we will see a bit later. The idea is to compress the content of drive C and store it as a zip archive on drive C. Whenever the system boots, we will extract the content to the RAM drive and continue the boot process from drive D. So, then let's create our first RAM drive image. To do so, I will use a bit of a cryptic command, which I will explain briefly. If you need more information, pkzip has a comprehensive help screen that outlines all the options you can use to configure the archiving process. The parameters I'm using are as follows. 
RP is instructing PKSIP to store folder information. WHS defines how hidden and system files should be treated. And RAMDOS is the name of our zip archive. Finally, we specify what files should be added to the archive. In our case, everything on drive C. Please note that the parameters are case sensitive. And then PKSIP compresses the content of drive C. There is also a possibility to change the compression ratio. If you want more speed and don't mind a larger archive, you can turn off the compression entirely. Once the content of drive C has been archived, we can see the ramdos.zip file on drive D. I want to copy this file to drive C and also rename it because we will install Windows on this drive later on. Our archive is now available on drive C with the name ramdisk.zip. So far, nothing has changed. After a restart, the RAM drive is empty because it loses all its data after a restart. Therefore, we have to restore the content each time we boot the system. To do this, we need another tool, pkunzip. This tool extracts the files and folders of an archive to a specific path or drive. Since we want the extraction to happen every time we boot the system, the easiest approach is to add a call to pkunzip into our outer exec but. We need to add the switch D to tell the tool to recreate the folder structure. And then we add the archive name and the destination. After the files have been extracted, we can continue the boot process from drive D. Therefore, we update references in the path and temp variables to reference drive D. Also, pkunzip should be placed on drive C to be available whenever the system boots. And that is all we need to do for now. Let's reboot and see if it works. The moment DOS executes the content of autoexec but, files are extracted to drive D from the archive located on drive C. After about 15 seconds, the process finished and we can see the file structure that was originally on drive C, now on our RAM drive D. Great! That is really neat. But of course, there is a huge drawback. Whenever we add, modify or delete files, the changes are not reflected in our archive on drive C. We would have to trigger a manual update whenever we restart or switch off our system. Unfortunately, there is no easy way to implement this. And we have to remember to update our archive each time we make changes to the files on the RAM drive. To make this process a little bit easier, we can create a file that, when executed, takes care of updating our archive with the changes from the RAM drive. PKSIP has built-in functionality to identify changed files. We're going to use it to reduce the amount of files that need to be compressed. To tell pkzip to update the archive with changed files only, we need to use the switch u. The rest of the command should be familiar to you as it is the same one we used when creating our initial archive. Before we can test it, we need to copy pkzip to our RAM drive. Once this is done, we can execute save.bat. We created two new files on drive D. We copied the executable pkzip and added the file save.bat. Both files were identified and appear in the log output. That's great! Our archive of the RAM drive has been updated and we should have those files available after a reboot. And indeed, both files appeared during the extraction process and show up on our RAM drive. Everything is in place and we are ready to install Windows on our RAM drive. To be honest, I expected a lot of issues during the installation. But surprisingly, the process is identical to an installation on a regular hard drive. Except for two occasions that require a bit of attention. First is the configuration of virtual memory, probably better understood today as swap or page file. By default, the Windows installer places that file on drive C, which is our fixed disk. Considering that we have very limited space on our RAM drive, this is the correct location to place this file. So no changes here. The rest of the installation went without any intervention. Even the new entries in the autoexec but were correct. Surprisingly, the Windows setup picked the files from drive C and not from drive D. I guess the installer knows which files are used during the boot process. At the end of the installation comes a crucial moment. If we would reboot the system, our installation would be gone because it has not yet been added to our archive. Therefore, we need to exit the installation and call our save routine. Similar to what we have seen before, the files are added to the archive in case they do not yet exist or have changed. The update method has one little drawback however for which I couldn't find a proper solution yet. Deleting a file from the RAM drive will not delete it from the archive. We either have to call a command manually or implement a much more complex way to determine which files have been deleted on the RAM drive. 
Since I'm not in the mood for such complex scripting, I think for this use case, a complete re-archive of drive D is much easier. Basically what we have done the very first time when we created an archive of MS-DOS. But now let's see if Windows 3.1 is going to start from our RAM drive. Wow, Windows 3.1 starts without any issues. And it's fast. Everything seems to work perfectly. When we open the file manager, we see drive A and drive C, but also drive D, the drive on which Windows is installed. And look at the icon, it's a RAM module. Windows 3.1 is aware of the RAM drive and even has an appropriate icon for it. Otherwise, the operating system behaves as if it was running from a regular disk. However, instead of residing on a disk, it is stored on those memory chips. Of course, we are very limited by space, but it is enough for DOS and Windows, which consume about 13 to 15 megabytes. That leaves us with about 10 megabytes of free space on our RAM drive. If there is a need to install applications, which would require more space, we can utilize drive C. To finalize this setup, we can clean drive C from the unnecessary DOS installation. We only need the boot files, which include io.sys, msdos.sys, command.com, and our configuration files, config.sys and autoexec but. And then we need to go ahead and copy the files that are referenced in our configuration files to a different folder. I decided to call my folder boot and copied all the files I needed into it. Of course, you can copy whatever files you would like, but the essential files are hymem.sys, ramdrive.sys, setver.exe, and smartdrive.exe. Those four files are referenced in the config files. I additionally loaded emm386.exe, which is required to get emulated EMS memory, but this is not required for the setup we have seen today. Finally, we need to update the path names in our configuration files to reference the new boot directory. The last step is to delete the DOS directory and we're done. And that is all that is necessary to set up a RAM drive in MS-DOS and have a halfway decent solution to retain data. We were even able to install Windows 3.1 and run it from memory. We just have to remember to execute our save routine whenever we change something. I prepared a small batch script that can create a full backup, which solves the issue with deleted files, or update the existing archive with changed files only. And if I don't like the changes I made in the current session, they will be gone after I restart the system. And that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed this little excursion looking at RAM drives. Were you aware that MS-DOS shipped with a driver to easily create RAM drives? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Also, please like the video and subscribe. This will help the channel grow and keep me motivated. Thanks for watching and I will see you in the next video.